Good morning, everyone. Or good morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, let's see. Well, thank you for attending our session. Can you hear me OK? Yep, all right. So this is my first time at the DH conference, and it's been wonderful to learn about fascinating projects that are going on right now. And so we'd like to share this morning the, our collaborative DH research project, Mapping Color and History. I'm Gina Kim, and a project director and PI, and I'm fortunate to uh, present this project with our ABLE digital humanities computing software engineer, Cole Crawford. And we'll take turns presenting, so I'll explain the context, how it came about, mainly why and how I started pursuing this project in the first place, and provide kind of general overview of the project, and Cole will discuss a few technical components behind the project, mainly the IIIF and the Mirador usage that is also integral to the project. And I will wrap up with sharing some discoveries that we have already made through this project. So, and this is your starting point of, and we have a big team. So mapping color in history, or I'll refer to it as MCH, is uh, a digital humanities project that brings together the scientific data drawn from existing and ongoing material analysis of pigments in Asian painting in a historical perspective. And uh, it really tried to document pigments and their material properties, but also it enables an in-depth historical analysis of pigment data through a search tool that identifies specific examples and their locations in both time and space. And it takes an object-based entry method for data collection instead of pigment-based uh, organization scheme taken in existing pigment databases and publications. And these are sort of some of the significance that we, or aims of the project that, uh, so MCH enables a systematic compilation of data uh, being generated in various institutions, and it also collects and generates new knowledge on the material history of color, and and it also advances our general understanding of the history of pigments or global history of pigments, I, I would add. And it uh, lastly, it really facilitates interdisciplinary collaboration, bridging art and science for historical research, knowledge production, and resource sharing. So. I came up with this project working on this book, uh, Garland of Visions, Color, Tantra, and Material History of Painting, published in 2021. And one of the key questions that the book asked was, why do primary colors dominate the palette of Indian painting, especially manuscript paintings from South Asia? And from early on, searching for imic or sort of within the tradition uh, understanding of color or color terms, I realize there are so many limitations in relying on survival textual sources for information. For instance, this translation of Sanskrit drama uh, renders this term as red arsenic. That's, uh, that's sort of a glossary provided by a translator. But in the context of this text, it, it most likely, in the context of historical context of this text, it is most likely hematite or iron-based uh, red ochre that's probably being uh, fetched, which is very frequent in northern India. And in fact, if you look up a color term in a Sanskrit dictionary, the broad semantic range of Sanskrit makes it challenging to know for certain what is a material that's intended to have been used according to a textual source? So, for instance, here you have Sindura as red lead, minium, and vermilion, and red lead and vermilion are the same thing. Uh, uh, red lead and minium are the same thing. Vermilion is a completely different pigment. This is uh, mercury sulfide. So, uh, you kind of can't rely on these textual sources uh, necessarily to understand what was actually in use and intended. And another question I like to ask all the time is how blue is this Hindu god Krishna? And this is my pop-up quiz for anyone interested in studying Indian painting. If you care to identify all of these objects, go for it. Uh, so, <laughs> and you see really diverse range of blue colorants that were used to paint Krishna. And you know, today you will see that version of Krishna. And if you like Google Krishna, you will have like animated versions of Krishna with much deeper or brilliant blue colors. So I uh, really got interested in understanding the artisanal intelligence that produced and shaped these different shades of and hues of blue. And in a way, an artist make you see the color of Krishna in a certain way in given time 
and space. So, and Harvard turned out to be an ideal place for this query because we have a big conservation lab with research scientists and an amazing Indian painting collection. And we are also next to the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston, with equally fantastic conservation lab, uh, research lab, and a superb Indian painting collection. So I describe the MCH structure as a three-legged stool. And we need all three legs equally for the MC project, MCH project to work. And each leg has its sort of unique constituencies in different disciplines. And, and it, we started working on developing the database with a small internal grant in 2018 and subsequently received uh, numerous internal and external grants that grew different sub subsections as little babies started growing out of these all uh, sort of different areas. And our sort of research collaborators and research partners in the museum sector continued to grow. And we just received a, another NEH grant this year to start transforming the database to a research platform and just made an offer to a postdoctoral fellow. And this is sort of some of the things that we are hoping to achieve with on this grant. <clears throat> So here are, well, I guess that's the aim uh, of future development. So here are the types of data captured on the database. And uh, so art historical data and conservation science data. And it, this is sort of come together through digital humanities tool. And again, I'm kind of novice to a field of, or this kind of methodology of digital humanities. So we just started with looking at that as a guide for kind of methodology and framing. And if you were to sort of have an anatomy of conservation uh, data sort of sample, this is what it looks like. And before showing you how this comes together on the project, let me talk a bit more about the historical context for this project, why it matters to map historical pigments focusing on South Asian materials. So there exists pigment databases. And this one here, I recommend if you're ever interested in like art materials and conservation, do check it out. It is a wiki-based resource that you can uh, go and search for any material that is used in ma art making across time and space. And, uh, but an existing pigment databases like this one, ColorX actually, is a great one, but most available databases are based on analytical studies on the Western European art canon. So what that means is that when a cobalt peak is found on a manuscript, a Jane manuscript that was dated to 1497, when we had a meeting, the scientist is like, oh, this must have been messed up. Like, you know, it must be later other duration to see this cobalt peak on this uh, 15th century painting because smalt, the cobalt containing uh, pigment smalt is believed to have been imported to India in the 17th century from Europe. And that's, this is a smalt sample seen in Iranian and Indian material from 17th and 18th century. And that matches the sort of pig signature of the sort of reference structure of the pigment that's produced in Europe. So, and this is sort of an example that we have that actually matches the reference spectra from European samples. So, uh, but we don't know if artisans in India ha may have used a cobalt-based pigment before the production and importation from Europe. We simply just don't have a baseline data uh, point for this knowledge. So when a conservation scientist uh, who's collaborating with us uh, from Detroit Institute of Art asked if we have seen smalt in India earlier, like in the 16th century, because she thought it was puzzling to find smalt on a 16th century manuscript. That was, she sent me a photograph saying like, have you seen this? And yes, we have. And I think we're getting somewhere with sort of understanding uh, maybe we can actually find a smalt before that supposed uh, importation from Europe. So I will show you uh, what the database looks like. This is our landing page. We decided to not do the live demo because that's going to be a little difficult. So that's the landing page. And when you go, you can actually sort of 
browse by color pigment and look at the map. And there is a little virtual exhibition section. It will go to the works that our uh, graduate student RAs have been doing, putting together the material. And the keyword search here is not as powerful, and this is one of the development that we want to do. So since I've been talking about Krishna, you search for how many works that we have data for um, are Krishna-based, and you can see them all appearing on the map. And you can also search by you can search for a, a pigment, so let's search for a smelt that I was talking about, and you can see them on the map, and it's not, these are the works that have smelt in them, and that's not clear that that's actually time bar, and we just fixed it. So if you uh, go to the website today, we'll actually have a timeline. So before you had to kind of go, uh, okay, if it will move to the next one. And other ways that we can browse this data includes browse by element, which does, it's actually quite useful for the scientists working on this uh, project. So you, we have cobalt appearing in 12 works. And if you wanna see where a tin appears in the corpus that we have, you can see them sort of on a map in that manner. Or uh, you can also browse by pigments and that's what I find useful. Okay, we have done that. If it will go. So this is browse by pigment section, and you will see that little C is you can click on that and we'll get more information about pigment on the Cameo, where it will give you related terms and uh, so reference spectra for all the known pigments that are in that database. So you can learn more about the pigment itself. And if you wanna know what kind of work has red lead, this is, these are sort of the types of work in our database that has red lead. And, and we actually collect ongoing research, but also published data. So there is a granular difference in uh, the, the, I guess, the detail level of data. So here, and we also had to make sure that we identify the, the level of confidence in identification if you ask, work with any conservation scientists. So if that carbon black is the bar is low, we just decide to use a cell signal to say certain to possible to uncertain. And this brilliant pigment, uh, Indian yellow, where that appears, and uh, that's you know, famously made of the urine of the cattle, so, or that is fed exclusive diet of mango leaves, so, and it, it fluoresces, uh, brilliantly fluoresces under UV. And you see the, one of the earliest instances of this in this work that's dated to 1588 in our collection. And this is some benefit of actually having a DH project that can actually bring together dispersed materials that are collected in different collections. So, and one of the ways that the, the, the hierarchy of the data is we actually organize all the pigment data by starting with the visible color and then so there's identification with the elements if that's available. And you do know this is analysis point and the description of point. Yeah. And you, I don't know if you I went by pretty quickly, but it says red hat or dark hat, and we don't know which of the red hat or dark hat she's talking about, and when you actually have it like this. But in the, the data we actually received from the scientists, um, it looks like this. <laughs> so we actually helped them by creating, and this was actually the work that we were doing in India. We have a whole uh, MCH India project that we actually created an annotated map for. So when we commissioned the analysis, we actually provide the analysis points for them. And this is where our RIA is actually creating this digitized pinpoint maps. And this is going to be the way that we're going to be presenting the data. And this is where IIIF and annotation tools are uh, helpful, so I'll hand it over to Cole to tell us more about that. 
So obviously representing visual works is core to this project. Um, we need to not only be able to display these in really high resolution, but we need to be able to annotate those specific points so we can show other researchers where these pigment samples are coming from. Um, so we decided to use uh, IIIF for this, uh, the International Image Interoperability Framework. Um, and some of the challenges associated with that are that uh, a lot of institutions are using this, but not everybody. So we have partner institutions in India, small museums of a few people. They're never going to have their own IIIF servers. Um, so we had to build uh, a pipeline that can take works from these institutions as well and uh, display them. Um, and we also had to do some work on the annotation front. Um, and ideally, uh, I'm a DH research software engineer. I wanted to build this in a way that could be re-architected uh, for future projects so that I don't have to stand up little IIIF servers for every single project that I maintain, um, which is what I've done in the past. Um, so we built a workflow for mapping color researchers to uh, take these high-res museum images and IIIFify them um, into mani uh, manifests and annotate them. And we're building on top of um, some really large-scale infrastructure that our library technical services team built. Um, the libraries host tens of millions of IIIF images. We'll have uh, a few thousand, perhaps. Um, so we wanted to be able to leverage this really big infrastructure project that they were already doing. Um, and ultimately, I built like a library for uh, clients to interact with their big infrastructure project, um, an adapter for Mirador to work with an annotation server, um, and did some more customization there. So what does this look like? Um, this is our IIIF pipeline. As a research assistant, uh, you'll get these big image assets. You'll add um, metadata to the works in our database. Um, you might add a little bit of a different or extra metadata for this manifest, and you just upload your images. Those get dropped into an S3 bucket that's owned by the project, and then um, it creates this ingest request for our library infrastructure. Um, all of that goes through this really complicated microservices framework that I understood at one point and abstracted away so I don't have to understand anymore. <laughs> um, and they take care of all of this. They take that metadata that we provided with our images, and uh, they create manifests for this, create mint URNs for everything. Um, they have uh, kind of a, um, a backlog server microservices set up. And all that we care about is that we get a manifest and some thumbnails back, and then we can use those within the project. Um, so I built this library that kind of wraps all this up. Uh, it took a long time to build, but now we can get these these triple after resources into our project in about 50 lines of code, which is uh, fantastic, and it's reusable by other projects uh, on campus too. What does this look like? Um, this is going to go to our uh, backend admin interface. Um, we go to an existing work. Um, it's already pulling in a lot of this metadata that's uh, entered on the work. We can go and create this manifest. We might want to add a separate summary here um, and upload images. We can have as many as we want, in this case, just the one, and go ahead and save this. And then that gets kicked off to the library infrastructure. And um, we can see at the top that it's processing there. It usually takes a minute or two. And then we get this uh, manifest back. And if we open this up, that's the, the IIIF manifest that we have. Um, and within the admin interface, then we can see our, uh, our metadata. And it also appears on the front end. We saw um, Gina displaying uh, Mirador is uh, the viewer. Um, we're pretty invested in that application. And um, again, you can see that we've got that manifest that we just created. Um, and the final piece that we're still currently working on is, oh, I see what you're saying. There we go. Um, doing the annotations. Um, so we are using CatchPy, which is an annotation server. Uh, we don't yet have the kind of institutional level support for annotations that we do for creating IIIF content. Um, but I, I extended Mirador to allow uh, it to connect to 
the project's metadata. So we're annotating these particular points, not with just a point like you would typically do with uh, um, Mirador, but with enough metadata to connect back to the actual uh, analyses with which are nested within these, these works. So we're adding the visible color and we're adding the analysis methodology, Raman, XRF, um, so that you can uh, then filter by whatever particular analysis you're interested in. And I'll turn it back to Gina for a couple minutes to close us out. Bev? Oh no. Oh no. Oh no, where did it go? All right, so, oh, so we're already making some interesting discoveries uh, and seeing historical trends. So this was sort of the work that was earlier done by our scientists at MFA and, and at HEM and more recent work, actually, one of the exciting new discoveries that our scientists are exci excited about is uh, that the team identifies sort of, this is sort of a new set of data that came through, through our project that uh, they identified this artificial arsenic sulfide that's only recent been, recently been identified in a much later European work. So uh, it's really adding to the historical knowledge of pigment production across the globe. And the product, project has many research questions that are really related to uh, core sort of research questions that I have. But, uh, and, but the database model and research tools that develop uh, should be useful and applicable for anyone interested in color and research from anywhere in their globe. So uh, that's the hope that we will expand. So thank you for your attention.